Hello, and welcome to Farm Buds, compounding professional narratives with student perspectives. I'm Sierra. And I'm Liz. Today, we are joined by Dr. Eve Van Wagner, an ambulatory care pharmacist. Hi, Dr. Van Wagner. So the first question we have for you is, why did you pursue a career in pharmacy? <laughs> well, I came about a kind of a long way around as I, uh, my, my first career was actually, well, my first degree was broadcast communications. You know, we uh, moved out of state, had three kids, moved around a few different times, crossed, you know, uh, to another country, came back, and I'm like, okay, now I can use my degree that I always wanted to use, and I did not want to do that anymore. So I started taking classes that I thought sounded interesting that I didn't take as much the first time through chemistry and biology, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, okay, so what do I do with this? And I followed around uh, pharmacists that worked at a nuclear pharmacy at the time, and then someone who had an independent pharmacy. Because I was asking people, so what do I use these classes for? And they're like, well, chemical engineering, pharmacy, da, 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 da. And so I tried out different things. And when I followed the pharmacists around and saw what they did, saw the skills that they used, saw the different areas that were possible, I was absolutely hooked. So that's what got me interested. So basically, I didn't want to do my other career. I actually decided that this was going to be a lot more fun. So I kind of came about a very roundabout sort of way. That's cool. <laughs> that's really cool. I've had an odd life. How does one just <laughs> run into a nuclear pharmacist? Yeah. Walk us through that. Yeah. How did that happen? Yes, yeah. that's a good question. Um, family, I have a couple of family members that are in healthcare and started asking around if they knew anyone that was a pharmacist and stuff like that. And then just finally, through a very circuitous route, found this person that was a nuclear pharmacist that was willing to let me shadow for a couple of days. Hmm. <laughs> you just got to talk to a lot of people. Yeah. And it worked. Oh. <laughs> so that being said, where did you end up going to pharmacy school? Yes. Well, I had a husband who had a career at that time, a 20-year career or so, and three teenage, well, two, a te two teenage daughters and an elementary school child. So I played just in Utah. <laughs> I, don't blame you. I was like, a, it was a one-shot deal. It was either going to work or it wasn't going to work. And luckily, I got into the U and uh, was able to go here, which was so fabulous. That's awesome. <laughs> so then as a, I guess, in your primary career now, what does a day look like to you? Oh, yes. Well, ambulatory care pharmacy is, is absolutely fascinating because there's so many facets of it. So um, I sit with the providers, with our doctors. We have internal medicine and family medicine doctors. I sit there. It's also our nurses, our MAs, our social workers, our care managers. I sit all up with that team in the areas where they see patients. And so it allows me a lot of opportunity as far as to um, intervene or to be asked questions, those types of things. So I take all sorts of things as they come. I have patients that I see in office that are scheduled to see me. I have patients that the doctors see and say, oh my goodness, we need to get them to talk to a pharmacist. There's this problem or this problem. So I'll see them as a warm handoff. I have patients that I've already started following and helping out with different things. And I do telephone follow-up with some of them, um, office follow-up with some of them, my chart, which is an electronic um, means of communicating that's secure. Um, so the, that's all the patient follow-up. So we use the collaborative practice agreements for Utah. You can use a collaborative practice agreement to be able to manage people's medications um, through the under the doctor's name. Um, with being able to write the prescriptions, change the prescriptions, start new prescriptions, stop prescriptions, order labs, do all the education and stuff with it. So I work under those collaborative practice agreements with these patients when the, when the doctors um, identify an issue or when I identify one and ask to work with somebody. And I can use, the nice thing is our CPA now with ambulatory care with the U of U is a carve out versus a carve in. So we're able to deal with any disease state that is ambulatory care. We're all board certified in ambulatory care. So anything that we feel comfortable, that we feel like is in our scope, um, that we are comfortable managing, we can manage through that CPA. So we end up doing a lot of different management. Diabetes is always the big one. So we do a lot of that. And so those follow-ups are, you know, patients that are new to me, that I see in the office, that the doctor hand off to me, that I see as they're there, that I call and follow up later, we just did your insulin. How's it working? Let's make another change to it. Actually, let's stop that and start this medication. So there's a lot of that CPA management specifically in that situation. But 
in the course of the day, we also take messages from the MAs. If they come in from patients, um, they'll route them to us if they're medication related. We get, you know, what we call um, consults basically from our doctors where they come by and say, hey, I was wondering about this, or I had a patient ask about this, or a patient has this condition. Then they'll ask me what it's something medication related that um, they have a question on so I can take care of that. I'm also very lucky that I get to help with students. So I have, I precept students as well as a, a PGY1 resident, as well as any other PGY residents that need ambulatory care rotation. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of learners on, on rotation with me, which I absolutely love. So that's always incorporated into my schedule. And then I do some teaching and education to also um, students at the college, but also to our providers in meetings or just by email or something like that. So, and, and during all of this, I also work with our social work and care manager to make sure that patients have all the resources that they need to help them to be healthy and successful. Um, so we do a lot of coordination between us to help make sure that they have everything that they need resource-wise. There's some things that I just can't help with. And so we bring them in oh, and vice versa. If they have medication issues that they're working with someone and they find that that's an issue, then they'll bring us in. So it's a really chaotic day usually. It's yeah, a lot that of fun. Like, no, I was just about to <laughs> say, you just do it all. Cow. Is there a bathroom break in between there? <laughs> Not usually. When do you have lunch? <laughs> yeah, when's lunch? Lunch is a very quick salad on the run. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, salads. So we hit on a lot of things there. Yes, yes. Um, but I guess kind of uh, – fundamental question uh -huh. is what is ambulatory care? Because my Excellent. big thing when I got into pharmacy school <laughs> is I was hearing all of these uh, different practice areas just shouted out. And I yes. was like, what is the difference between ambulatory care and internal medicine? Because they sound like the exact same thing. Yeah. Well, sure. most people get into pharmacy because of retail pharmacy or hospital pharmacy. That's it. Yeah. Most of these other areas of pharmacies, people know nothing about until they actually get in pharmacy school. So I have to spend a lot of time actually explaining what I do because I tell somebody I'm a pharmacist. They're like, oh, well, that's great. And they go by to see me at the pharmacy and they don't find me. Like, I thought I, I thought I'd find you. I'm not there. I'm not in the pharmacy. When I go to talk to a, a patient in clinic, oh, so did you just come up to talk to me? I'm like, no, I, I'm right here with your doctor so I can help with any of these needs. So ambulatory care basically just typically um, uh, pharmacists <laughs> that are ambulatory care pharmacists are in somehow embedded with that primary care team or some type of specialty team that's in a clinic. So this is going to be your um, your clinics out in the community. So we have, for the University of Utah, we have South Jordan, Redwood, Greenwood, all of those. Though we have pro pharmacists, ambulatory care pharmacists in each of those clinics sitting with the, pro the family medicine doctors, the internal medicine doctors, and con consulting on a few of the other types of specialties and helping to basically provide support for the providers, the MAs, um, the staff, as well as manage patients because there's a lot of diabetes out in the community. There's a lot of hypertension, smoking, asthma, things like this that are very, some of them are very medication heavy. So we help provide resources one way or another for those patients with those types of disease states that they'll be talking to their family practice internal medicine doctor about. And then since you're focused on outpatient, mm -hmm. how do you make the decision that that's not really included in your collaborative practice? When is it time for um, patients to seek acute treatment. Mm -hmm. So we do kind of a similar type of triage that you see your nurses do, your MAs, your doctors do, as far as for the acute care situations, is if they come in, or actually the, what, when it typically happens is I've given them a call to follow up on their diabetes, how their blood sugars are doing, what doses they're taking of their medications, how things are working, what questions they have. And I ask, so is there anything else I can help you with? And so if I get a, well, I've had this really sharp pain, you know, right underneath my ribs on my left side for the past three days and I feel nauseated, it won't go away. I'm like, okay, yeah, we need to have you go in and take, some, take care of something else. So if it's something that's not ongoing and long-term typically, or something that can't be treated by antibiotics at home, you know, something typically like strep or something along those lines, then that's something that we don't deal with. Um, so that would be something that I'd send them on to somebody else. And then there's some specialties that we specifically don't do because they're so involved. We have, do we have pharmacists that actually manage those specialties only, things like HIV, rheumatology, stuff like that. We actually will do some of the some of that peripheral stuff, especially if it has to do um, with everything else that we're dealing with at the same time, but they'll typically go to specialty pharmacists for those types of situations. 
So I guess, I guess in general, just so why ambulatory care? <laughs> was there something before ambulatory care? Was it retail? Tell no, me about it. actually it was hospital. I thought I loved oh, the yeah. adrenaline rush that everybody gets for yeah. a hospital. Yes, yes. No, I found out I didn't like that adrenaline rush. It so. starts to get a little draining, <laughs> it's I think, exhausting. after a little while. Yes. I worked hospital as an intern when I was in school, and I realized, first of all, the, the rush was too much most of the time. The other thing is I didn't get to know the patients. I'd go by their rooms, and I'd make recommendations or talk about things, drop things off. And I'd see them one day, and I'd come back for another another shift two days later, and they were gone. I'm like, what happened to them? I don't know. They were, you know, discharged or something. I'm like, well, what happened to them? And it drove me crazy. So I finally left hospital as an intern and went to an independent pharmacy and realized that you got to see people week after week, and you got to know about them and see how well they're doing and make recommendations and find out how it turned out and be able to, you know, learn about their kids and their vacations and stuff. And I guess I found out I was a real people person about that point and realized, yes, this is something I want to do, something where I can have long-term relationships. With ambulatory care, you definitely do that. I've been working at the same clinic for about eight years now. And I, I see the same patients over and over and over because, you know, there's always something coming up and something that we can help with. I have some coming back to ask to talk, to work with me, even though their doctor hasn't, you know, necessarily, you know, recommended it for any reason. And it's just fun because you really get to see long-term effect of what you're doing and how you're affecting people's lives. So I love it. <laughs> mm. So we obviously know she enjoys what she does. <laughs> that, that's yeah. not what we don't necessarily mm-hmm. need to ask. I mean, yes, you can see that. Yes. You can see that. So, yes. okay. So then you did mention, um, you know, how you're a preceptor and you talk with PGY1s. But, um, you know, so I guess in general, what other kind of educational trainings or kind of what kind of role do you play in terms of pharmacy students and pharmacy school, if any? Yes, I love working with the college and the students, residents, everybody. So I take as many opportunities as I can to work with uh, the students. So I become an adjunct faculty member um, because of the amount of students I take on rotation. And I do a couple of lectures in the OTC class on family planning, which is, you know, one of the things I just absolutely love. It's one of my heart's desires. And I try to, you know, make sure that I come to different recitations and I help with any types of panels that they do. I try to just stay involved as much as I can in what's going on in at the college without being a faculty member so that I can, that I can be there to teach. But the, all, the other thing is when you deal with students, they have an enthusiasm, they have a love for learning, and they're learning the latest information and they love to share it. So I end up keeping myself up to date. I end up keeping myself we excited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you it. students are great for that. Yeah, we definitely get We're the, the walking enthusiasm. information. We're walking information. Yes, it is so nice. I learned so much from the other side. <laughs> uh, yeah, new diabetes clinical guidelines coming out. I know. In January. Around the corner. Oh, Mark yeah. your calendar, set alarms. <laughs> it's going to be huge. <laughs> So how do you balance your responsibilities at the college with your clinical practice? Yes, that's take, taken some practice. Is I found early on that as pharmacists, we're not really good at knowing our boundaries and saying no. We tend to just say, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'd love to try that. And we tend to overdo. So I found I was doing that way too much at the beginning of my career. So over time, I've learned to kind of set those boundaries of okay, it's a certain time I'm heading out and I'll figure out everything else tomorrow. And that's the other great thing of ambulatory care. Nothing's an absolute emergency. Most of it can wait till tomorrow. So I was when I started taking on things at work and then adding students to it and teaching to it, I got really overwhelmed until I started setting those boundaries. And actually, that's just been great is I just know when to stop things. And if I start realizing that I can't do that, then I start cutting back on things. But So far, I haven't had to do that with too much, so that's nice. (laughs) And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because as healthcare providers, it's so hard to care for other people when Mm -hmm. you don't take care of yourself first. We're really bad at that, and we it's something that we all need to take a take a step to look at kind of how our life balance is working and make sure that it's where we want it to be. And some people want to work all the time, and that's great, but that's not everybody. And so we need to find out, figure out how to do boundaries. I need a self-help book in that. Oh, we have to. Somebody write one. (laughs) Put that on the to-do list. We say yes to everything, so someone write a self-help book, please. Um, 
So I guess we should just pop into, because what piqued me is sexual health. Yes. And we know you. I mean, we're <laughs> students, so let's be honest. That's what this podcast is about. So we clearly remember taking the OTC over-the-counter classes, as so we call it. So in as a pharmacist, what role do we play or could we play in sexual health and family planning? Oh, yes. And it's I feel like this is one area where retail can really make a huge difference. Um, they're right there. Facing the public every day, they see this. They see people walking up and down the aisles. They know where they're, you know, where they're spending more time, where they look confused, things like that. So that's one thing. Is I, I feel like retail can make a huge, huge difference in this by just watching people and realizing when somebody looks like they have a question, or when somebody brings up condoms, or they bring up spermicides, or they bring up a female condom or something to the register, and they can say, you know, just kind of say. You know what? Do you, what? It, what type of information can I give you about this? Um, have you used this before? You know, um, have you know? Is this, is this? Have you tried anything else? Is this your preferred? Or be, you know, would you like me to go over anything else that might be good for you? By just being there to just ask questions, present information, and help to make sure that people leave the pharmacy with the information that they have to keep themselves safe. So I really, retail is a huge place to do that. Of course, primary care, we do that as well. Um, but I really feel like they have a, an amazing opportunity to be able to really face the face the public and be able to see what's happening and be able to answer those questions really easily in a very short amount of time too. Because I know that, you know, sexual health, it feels very taboo or very, dirty or inappropriate <laughs> and 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 you know we it sounds weird to say that out loud but i mean there's it's a very important thing because it's the unknown and not knowing is can create a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion as well as just mm -hmm. you know make create errors that are could be preventable and yes. so you know do you think that 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 is something like a like a barrier or a wall or a ceiling as that we should say that we should start to break or feel more comfortable and how could we become more comfortable with that yes you know and we i find in utah i mean there's a lot of places where it's a problem but utah i feel like we have a, a couple of issues that we are trying to work through to be able to provide that type of information and get rid of those taboos. Yeah. I have three, like I said, I have three daughters. And when they were teenagers, our, our conversations were extremely open. And their friends would come over, and it's amazing how little that they understood and knew for the age that they should. Right. Um, and so I would often get questions from my daughter's friends and stuff, just having never spoken to their parents about it. And I'm like, why, you know, why don't you go home and talk to your parents? Oh, they won't talk about that. So I really think there's a cultural thing is that it's very, it, we've made it taboo, whereas these kids really want to learn. So when I talk to people about sexual health, when I talk to them about family planning, I try to just be very open, very honest, and be very clear on my um, information so that we are sure that, um, that it, by acting that way, we make them feel comfortable and they're more likely to listen to us. We don't have to act like it's taboo, act like it's scary. It's not a scary, it's not a taboo thing. The young kids these days really want information. They want accurate, they want helpful information. And so it's something that we need to kind of, kind of, I don't know, remove that barrier, especially from us older right. adults that have not been used to talking about it before. Right. And just realize that the kids are not as uncomfortable as we are. And if you're open, honest, and just, you know, answer their questions, then usually there's not an issue and people don't have the problems that they think are out there, the yeah. bears that they put in their mind, really, when it's really not an issue for most people. Yeah. Do you think we're moving in the right direction? Slowly. Like, are these things getting easier to talk about? Slowly. Oh, that's been one of the joys of watching my girls as they grow up with their friends. So this last um, summer, you know, there's a huge thing, you know, there's a mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade thing that came through. And a lot of my daughter's friends started getting extremely nervous. I mean, it's not that they were going to go out and have something done. Having that backup line really made them feel, okay, I'm doing all I can. If something absolutely happens, this is an option for me. And so there was, because of that, uh, that issue that occurred, there was a lot of discussion among them. So we started talking about what plan B is. We started talking about the different hormonal options to make sure that they understood them. Some of them were like, I tried this, but it didn't work. I'm like, well, if you tried this. And so it, it brought up a great conversation with my kids and their friends. And I really feel like, like I said, this younger generation is really open to the idea if you give them the chance to talk about and then help lead them to the most accurate information. So I do think we're getting there. 
I just think it's just going to be a long, slow process as this type of thing usually is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think with the current political climate that we're yes. experiencing right now, it really shed light for me on how important it is for healthcare providers to mm-hmm. educate on proactive measures. Yes that um, both consenting partners can take. Yes, and that's another thing is I found that I've been surprised how the young men have gotten into this conversation and how I've been able to provide information for them that just things that they never even thought of. It doesn't affect them, some of of these issues. And so having these conversations and being open and talking about them and having, having the issues out there that lead people to talk about it really helps make a difference for us to talk about. And healthcare people, healthcare workers, we're the ones that, get this information. We're the ones that are taught this information. We're definitely the ones that should be handing it out as well. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me like maybe a lot of that taboo, like you said, is that we just didn't know, you know, a lot of people just didn't know how to approach it. And they think that that was a way of, how do you even start a conversation aside from seeing someone buy a condom? Because half the time you're like, I'm going to go to the self-checkout, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Um, Or I'm not going to buy that at the pharmacy. But it's, it's, I think it is important that the pharmacists are challenged with that. And I do appreciate the, and I hate to say aggressive, but I do appreciate the aggressive and the open of the, of the, uh, you know, kids and, and young adults today, because without that, I don't know if we would be even moving in any direction. Yeah. And that's a question I get from students all the time when we're talking about the subjects, like, well, how do I approach it? I'm like, you just head on approach. It is really the best way of doing it. You're a healthcare worker. Somebody's asking questions. Somebody has a certain situation. Somebody looks confused. They kind of expect you to ask questions and help them. So just do it. If you're comfortable, if you're honest, if you're, you know, giving just just wanting to give it information to educate, they're going to not be as uncomfortable about it. So really just straightforward. I find that people expect healthcare workers to talk about these things. They're they're rarely shocked that this is a conversation that they're going to have. I think a lot of it may be things are only awkward if you make it awkward, yes, right? Exactly. So sometimes you just got to dive right in. So mm-hmm. I think that's really great. Um, so what do you think the future of pharmacy looks like? Oh, geez. It's mm-hmm. changing daily. <laughs> it's already changed you don't so get much. Lunch breaks, that's for no, sure. No, no. Right. Lunch breaks, bathroom breaks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It is, um, we're going to be used more and more as I hate this term, but basically a mid-level provider. We are in a shortage of doctors, especially when you come to primary care, family medicine, internal medicine. Your MDs are really coming up short. We just don't have enough of them for our population. And so you're looking at these other options. And I think pharmacists are continually going to be brought in to help to kind of fill those gaps, which we already are. But I think it's become even a bigger, bigger issue. So we'll be even more relied upon eventually. Do you see those gaps mostly outpatient or inpatient? Well, outpatient's definitely what I'm more familiar with. Right. Um, but definitely, as we saw with our whole recent COVID um, pandemic, is that, you know, that's another situation where pharmacists were getting really pulled in. We were, they were really taking people in the hospital and trying to spread them as thin as they could, trying to get all the information. We ha- we were on the go learning about a major crisis with huge implications as well as different um, possibilities for vaccines and treatments. And pharmacists were constantly updating their knowledge and sharing that with teams. And so that was really, and that was in the hospital and that was outpatient as well. Um, so I think it just, we're going to be pulled in more and more to provide education and support at all levels. But I really see that in primary care right now. Yeah. And I can definitely say the pandemic was absolutely devastating. But as a student, it was very interesting to see the science happening in real time. Yeah. And we were in the classroom reading these primary literature articles mm-hmm. with our professors. And I thought that was a very interesting way to le- learn, quite hands-on. <laughs> yes. And it, they were open published. You, 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 you got them as soon as they were out. Everybody was able to go through them, hash them through. It was really interesting to watch the process as it unfolded, basically. Mm-hmm. So I guess in your, in your career then, do you have an achievement that you're most proud of? <laughs> Oh, that's a tricky Aside one. from graduating pharmacy school. Oh, just making it through was yeah. great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was an accomplishment with three kids. And for, <laughs> for sure. I, I feel you. So that, honestly, is probably one of the bigger ones. But I really, my one of my, pri- one of my pride um, 
experiences is being able to teach the OTC lecture than family planning is because I had taught my daughters and we had changed the discussion in, around us um, in our families and things like that. And to be able to, ex- be able to pass it on to students in some way was, has been a great opportunity for me. And I absolutely love doing it. So that's, that's a big one besides graduating with, you know, kids at home as well. <laughs> I can say that I have yet to meet someone that is as passionate about the HPV vaccine <laughs> as you are. Yes, true. Oh, the amount of boyfriends we've got to get that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess, too, um, if uh, uh, for the public listening and for mm-hmm. students, what is one thing that you wish someone, a.k.a. anyone in the public, a friend, a family member, or even a, you know, a patient or a, pr- a prospective student, what, would, what is one thing you wish they would know about pharmacists in general? That we're not just in the retail pharmacy. We have great pharmacists there, but we are everywhere. We are in the hospitals. We are in the clinics. We are in nuclear pharmacy. We have independent pharmacies. We're in drug information. We Some of our people are taking care of the drug inf- drug shortage information and making sure that it, the, the national information's out there so people know where it's going. We're, we're definitely anywhere there's medication questions, concerns, management, that's where pharmacists are. And I just don't think that most people are aware of that. So there's a lot of opportunities and options. And I think as time goes on, it's going to get just more more robust as far as the options that we have. Are you ever at a dinner party and you tell someone that you're a pharmacist that works at a clinic and they're like, no, you're not. Yeah. Yes, for real. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, it's it's quite entertaining. <laughs> so you don't just count pills? Yeah, so I get that one all the time. Yeah. You count pills. I'm like, no, I actually don't touch pills. <laughs> just, we have some great pharmacists that do that. I'm just We don't just count by fives all day. Is that what you're yeah. telling me? If you go look at the, the pharmacy, I'm just not going to be there. But <laughs> that's where I work, I swear. <laughs> and I guess, could you elaborate a little more about your role on the healthcare team? Mm-hmm. Like, do you feel like you're making a difference along with the doctors? Does a pharmacist <laughs> really have to be there? Oh, well, at first, I don't think they thought we needed to. But now when there's any type of information that they might pull us away for some reason, either to help with another clinic or days doing something else, my providers and my MI, MAs, my nurse, they all have an absolute breakdown because they've learned what we can do now is they didn't realize that not only could we do the management through CPAs, diabetes, hypertension, osteoporosis, all of those. Not only can we do that management with your patients, not only could we help do a comprehensive comprehensive review and get lists accurate and make sure they're appropriate and make sure that they're using the right things, but we also, when the doctor sends tries to send a prescription for a certain thing that isn't going to work, they're sending it from Manjaro and it has to be specific doses and things like that, We've been able to come in and say, oh, that's not how you do this. This You have to do it this way. Otherwise, we're going to hear back from the pharmacy because they're not going to fill it with that. So we've been able to do a lot of education and not not just take some some the load off them, but provide education so that makes their job easier so we get less pushback from other areas. So it's um, it's become quite interesting. You doctor, if, Doctors will start working at our clinics partly because we have the teams we have. Have you noticed a shift in the attitude about how other healthcare yes. providers feel about pharmacists since you've started? Yes, even in just it's just been eight years that I've been that I've been practicing, and you, yes, you can. We've seen this shift. So when I started at South Jordan, um, we actually were in the pharmacy, so we were doing MTM pharmacy, MTM type pharmacy out of consultation rooms out of the retail pharmacy, which was great. But when we had to talk to a doctor or the doctor had question, it was really tricky. So they actually moved us up while, like the second year I was there, to sit up with the providers, and that totally changed the dynamic of what they thought we did and how they used us. Because um, I know what goes on in the pharmacy. I've done some. I've done stuff there. I can look into things. I have friends I can ask questions from. We call down, but being up with the providers, I can provide a whole different level of education and management that we couldn't do from where we were. So it's been a definite shift on what they what they want from us. Because before they just give referrals, take care of diabetes, take care of diabetes, take care of diabetes. And there's really no other information or education we've provided. Mm-hmm. Now that we're up there, I'm constantly asked, answering questions. I'm constantly catching things that the MA is saying, go, oh, no, don't write it like that. Or, oh, there's a PA for metformin. Oh, there should not be. There's something wrong with that. Even little things like that has made a big difference on how they 
how they work and how they approach things. And so it's made jobs easier for them as far as that. So there's a whole, the whole CPA management side, but there's a whole just drug information side. How do you feel that your time in the clinic is managed? Like as far as how it's divided between talking to providers and talking to patients and maybe some of the running test claims Mm -hmm. at your workstation that sort of thing. Yes, luckily we have technicians with our clinics that do all of our that do test claims um, for everything, and they call our patients um, to gather information, to set up appointments, things like that. So it's really nice because that's been offloaded from us, so that we can provide more education and more time with um, providers and answering questions from MAs. So I'd say a, for my clinic, I'm probably about. of the time on the phone or in office with patients in some way or answering, you know, electronic electronic messages, things like that from patients. I'd say that's probably about that. And the other 25 is somehow drug information, um, messages that are sent to me from MAs, what I hear behind me that I jump in on because that just doesn't sound right, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it it changes if I have a resident or student or things like that, of course. But that would be the general breakdown, I would say. So I guess we can go back to, you know, just from a student perspective, right, Mm -hmm. in terms of your, um, you know, role teaching this um, public health, you know, public health, sexual health and family planning for your this over the counter class that we take here, at least with the U. Um, My question for you is, you know, students that you that are taking that class, how from the start moment that you start teaching family planning, is there a sense of like apprehension or fear? And does that change at the end of your section that you've taught? Oh, yes. When I first walk in and um, start, because I start with the, the big pictures of the genitalia, so we make sure that we <laughs> yeah. have. Yeah, that's a good place to start. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. Right. Yes, you got to know yeah. what it looks yeah. like if you're exactly. going to talk about it, right? Everyone's face is like. And that's how I start. Here? Yeah, I kind of introduce myself and go right into that. And yeah. so, yes, I see automatic, especially in Utah and yeah. a lot of our Utah students. And I think it's a bit of an overwhelming shot for some of them. And so, yeah, so there's that definitely an apprehension of, oh, my goodness, how do I yeah. talk about this? This is this is not okay to be talking in a situation like this. And you can see it on everybody's faces. But then as we get going, because of my uh, interesting stories and uh, change um, it, experiences and stuff like that. It seems like I can put people pretty much at ease as we get through that. But the best part is when we start um, for the second lecture at the end, when we get out all of the actual products and mm-hmm. start working with them, that's mm-hmm. when I see all the all the students really kind of, okay, oh, this is something I can totally touch and see and feel and smell and know how it works. And so it's amazing how everybody just kind of eases right in once we get to that. So I bring in cucumbers <laughs> and I bring I do. <laughs> I, I was, was not prepared for those little <laughs> Starbucks cups. Oh, the Starbucks oh, yeah. cups for, our, yes. for the vaginas. Yes, yes, yes. 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 It was so yes. fun. So we use the con. So we can put condoms on, make sure how we know how they work, female and male, and the suppository, the uh, the spermicide suppositories, and play with those and stuff. So, so by the end, I've hopefully made everyone feel very comfortable that when the topic comes up, they're not nearly as concerned about how to address it. No, that. we can all just talk to the patient and say, okay, well, this is the way I was taught. I need a Starbucks <laughs> cup. I need yeah, this. Uh, do you have a cucumber by chance? Uh, no, but the reason I brought that up is because, you know, as you know, we're students and we, you are, you are our, one of our instructors. And I, I do remember a slide, and you were talking about something called a Galacticap. Yes. Well, guess what? No way. Absolutely. So for those that are listening in, um, I took a very long time to get this, but I, I did actually finally get a hold of this company. And now you have Galacticaps that you can awesome. show for this um coming up semester. I was actually yeah. just looking at ordering everything. I oh, just no. started sending things to Nick and I hadn't quite gotten got to it. these. <laughs> it took six weeks. It took six weeks. It took six weeks. weeks. Oh, I'm weeks. glad you got it. But I, I got them. Got it Look at time. that man's face on there. It's <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so now we can add Galacticaps yes. to the list, mm-hmm. which is, if you know, you know. Yes. And it's 
definitely one that they're is very going, interesting. They're, they're fascinating to teach about because it's such a unique approach. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. Oh, it was a good time. But I, I yes. turned to Sierra and I said, I'm on a mission. I think I went on right away. And it, it was still like being like, hey, look, this is what we're coming out. Put your name on the list. And then I waited a week, nothing. And then another week. And they're like, congratulations, we're going to send you some. But then I didn't get any. And then I finally get this creepy white envelope in my mailbox. And I'm like, was it discreet? This is sus. <laughs> this is really sus. It's suspicious. And I open up, I'm like, oh, fine. And then I put them in a book and then I kept them there. That is awesome. Does it say Galactic Cap like no. really big it on didn't, the envelope? It, honestly, it, no. it looked like a Larry H. Miller white envelope where you open it up saying, hey, you've been approved for $37,000. Come down to Larry H. Miller for a used car. That's what it looked like on All the outside. Right. And I'm like, this is nothing. I don't know. What the, and then I'm like, I'm just going to open it for fun. And there it popped. There was his face. That's what it looked like. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, that face is definitely entertaining too. Yes, yes. Was this ever FDA reviewed no. or anything? No. I don't think it has not been to my that I've no. seen. No. Not to my knowledge either, <laughs> but for science. For science, yes. For they science. have great reviews from users, but as far as efficacy, I cannot we say. We cannot say, say to that. <laughs> no, it did come with two sets. I ordered two sets and I tried one on a hose and it's very interesting to watch. <laughs> Just saying. Well, this Watering. Is de- yeah, I summer. definitely want students to know about this because I can just imagine oh, man. somebody coming up and asking, so I heard about. Oh, so, yes. yeah, these are things top that hit. they have to know about just in case. It was a top Google hit for sure. <laughs> and there's so much misinformation out there. there. It's oh, very important gosh. that healthcare providers know about that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one, that, one of the things that I'm so happy about with being able to teach that is I just feel like there's so much that people don't know, aren't taught, and Honestly, I was married probably 20 years before a lot of this really was when I started really getting enough information and go, oh, my goodness, I had no idea. So I can imagine other people out there with the, yeah, what their education and information is on it. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure. My parents didn't say it. They told me, nope, you're not even kissing a boy. Yes. You better just down under my roof. I'm like, excuse me. Excuse me. I don't know what that is. Go figure it out. That's most yeah. parents' approach, and it's yeah. yeah, it's not always most effective. <laughs> and that was it. It just died, and that was it. That was all. I learned about it in school mm-hmm. for two seconds. Yep. Oh yeah, and the education's just oh. Oh yeah, it was. It was, and even the teachers were very uncomfortable. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. We're just sitting there like, mm, can I go to the bathroom? Love to go around and teach at high schools. Yeah. I think I'd say much more than they prefer. Oh, I sure. say, so that yeah. probably would not be an option. <laughs> there are definitely some words that are off limits in Utah. I will say that. Yes. At least that's what I remember from my high school experience in Utah. Oh, so many things they don't and can't say. Mm-hmm. One day, slow change. Deep breath, deep breath. All right. Faces are a little red. And I guess we'll transition into, and I've been very excited about this question, what advice can you give to someone interested in pursuing a career in pharmacy? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, First, shadow. Get to know what pharmacy is a little bit before you go into it. Um, I think that's one thing that people don't really know what we're going into. Like we all talked about, is I had no idea how many different areas of pharmacy there were. And so definitely getting into it and making sure that's what you want to do. Because this is a commitment. This is not something you go into and go, you know what, never mind. I'm not going to do after all. So you want to know you're, that this is something that you're interested in. But definitely you need to be passionate about helping people. You need to be passionate about constantly learning. That's something my husband always says. He says, you're always learning things. He's an engineer. He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Our stuff doesn't really change. I mean, he does new things and stuff. But it's not quite the same way how yeah. we learn things, especially during COVID, constant learning. So be sure that you love helping people and be sure that you love learning because if you don't like to do th- those types of things, you're not going to like pharmacy. And just really just jump in. It's hard. It's exhausting the schooling. It's rough the residencies if you go into them, things like that. But it's so worth it at the end. There is so much um, pharmacy that is so rewarding. I mean, there's just every area you can go into for pharmacy offers something in return as far as what you gain back from the from the service that you provide, education you provide. So definitely something that is worth the hard work as long as you know exactly what you're getting into beforehand. For sure. I agree with that. How can you tell that you're making a difference? Hmm. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about what I do is because of the ambulatory care approach is I see someone from hopefully the beginning of what's going on or the beginning of what I can help with 
through to hopefully some type of resolution. So we get a lot of patients that come in. They're in 30s, 40s. They come in with an A1C of 14, which is extremely high. And the doctor's like, okay, this is this is where the pharmacist gets involved. I come in and do some insulin teaching. Almost 100% of the time we start insulin. We talk about lifestyle because, you know, there has to be lifestyle that goes along with it, um, as well as kind of answering questions on what diabetes is. I do a teaching on, you know, just pathophysiology of it. But the fun thing is I can watch them start, help them adjust, talk to them about lifestyle and how this is going to affect them long term and stuff, and be able to see them improve their health and go forward doing things that will continue, that they'll continue to be healthy with. So that's the fun thing about ambulatory is you actually get to see a lot of your outcomes and get to see where people end up. It's not always going to work. And some people, it's just too much. It's overwhelming for some reason, or there's other issues involved, but there's a lot of people that you can actually see come to improving their health through medications as well as education. And it's just really fun to watch. I had helped this one older guy who was able to go on his, a cruise that he'd been planning in Europe for ages. And they, he was had, you know, having problems with this diabetes right before. And we were able to get things situated. He was able to fly over without any problems, go on his cruise, come back and feel great. And it was just so fun to watch because he wasn't going to be able to do that um, in the, in the condition he was in just a few months before. Um, uh, when we started working with them. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. It's fun. <laughs> well, <clears throat> here on Farm Buds, we always and would like to propose <laughs> a budding question where, like I said, each episode, um, we like to ask an opinion in regard to something surrounding your professional interests. So for today's budding question, um, it is, is the calendar method an effective form of birth control? Oh, I think I say this in my lecture, usually calendar method is an, a very effective form of getting pregnant, of being able to tell when it you sh- when you should try so that you can actually get pregnant. Calendar method's really tricky, really tricky. Um, so many things involved that can go so wrong. Um, so if you're not regular, if you're starting to go through menopause and it's becoming irregular, if you're don't keep track very well for long enough, so you don't know how, that you're that you are irregular, um, or there's impulse control issues, so that you know you can't abstain during the time frame that you need to abstain, it's really tricky to make calendar method work. I love it as like a secondary or backup. So mm-hmm. using a condom or something like that, that if you don't want to use hormonal, it's a great option to kind of use them in conjunction because that really increases the chance of it being effective. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as the calendar method, as, as you guys know, I'm very much on, we want to have STI protection. Right. And this does not provide that, which in certain circumstances, it's going to be just fine, but there's a lot of situations where this isn't going to be um, a safe option for a lot of people. So calendar method's great in very, very specific situations for a very small amount of people and mostly as uh, supplemental to another form of birth control. Yeah, that's not me. I just don't calendar. think I can stay that on top of it. <laughs> yeah, no. It requires a lot of work, it honestly. Is <laughs> it is a lot. I, your girl can't do that. <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week it is. Oh, Man, the tracking. I just I try I track on my app, yeah. and oh my gosh, just I didn't realize how things were so far off because I, I finally started tracking. I'm like, wow, I thought I was pretty regular. Oh. Not so much. Apparently. Yeah, I have no idea. Mm-mm. I don't even know Mm-mm. what's going on. <laughs> Longest 28 days of my life. Yeah, seriously, for real. <laughs> Longest 28 days for sure. I'm like, no, oh uh-huh. man, oh man. It's 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 very time intensive, and I feel like there's an there's definitely some impulses that, um, yeah to make it an issue. Although they make cute calendars, you know, that's the only thing I spend most time picking out which one I want. And then it just, it's blank. And then it's becomes scratch paper, you know, always any piece of paper rip. So the better question is how do you start a calendar? (laughs) How do you find the willpower? How do you make yourself calendar? Mm. Mm, That is, that alone is going to take a whole different, I think, podcast to go through. (laughs) Back to the self-help book. Uh, Any users listening, we can just somebody get on that board. Yes, that would be nice. Great. (laughs) Well, I, that's all I have to ask. Um, I appreciate you coming in and we appreciate you for coming in and sharing about what you do and how much you love being a pharmacist and providing your expertise as well as just your narrative on what it is you do day in and day out and your contribution to the public. So thank you. My pleasure.
This was great. It gave me the motivation that I needed to make it through the week for my test on Friday. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. So, oh. yeah. The good old days. <laughs> yeah. That and better calendaring. Do yes. you look at it fondly? I do now. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> it was rough getting through, but I do have very fond memories of it now that I'm not in it. So, good luck. You're going to love it. Enjoy it while you can, as much as you can. And just, be, you know, be excited for what comes next because there's so many options. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. This is the Farm Buds signing off. Until next time, stay, stay curious. curious.